Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for your great love. Send your Holy Spirit to anoint my lips that I might say your words. And anoint the ears of those that hear that they might understand. May your will be done and may your love shine through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The story is told of a young man, young boy, who had a hero. He loved this hero because the hero always won. He got every book that he could, everything, anything that he could find out about this hero he wanted. But then he got a book. And as he began reading this book, the hero was getting kicked, knocked down. He wasn't winning. He said, something's wrong. This isn't what my hero is supposed to do. And he had to stop reading in the first chapter. And he turned to the last chapter of the book. And he read how the hero won. How he defeated the villain. And so with that knowledge, he was able to go back to the beginning of the book. And every time the villain seemed to be getting his way, he would say to the villain, if you only knew what was coming. The end of the book made all the difference. We've read the end of the book too, haven't we? We know what it's all about. And so, uh, some of the things that I'd like to share with you this morning are related to the gospel. Uh, the gospel has a very specific meaning and I hope that you'll understand it as we go through this this morning. We're very familiar with Matthew 24 verse 14 particularly this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. You remember Jesus has outlined a lot of things, wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. But he says these are all the beginning of sorrows. The end will come when this gospel has been preached in all the world. So what is the gospel? Technology is wonderful when it works the way you want it to. Oops, wrong direction. In the Greek, the writers of the New Testament, when they taught the word that we translate gospel is euangelion. And you Greek scholars that know how to pronounce that better than I do, please forgive my pronunciation. There are two parts to this word. U and angelion. U means good. Angelion means message or news. So euangelion is the good news. But there's a meaning to this word that I'd like to share with you. This was a word a common word in Greek. It had a specific meaning. When a king would go out to battle, those that were left behind wanted to know what was going on, whether their king won or not. If their king lost, they would either die or become slaves. If their king won, they were free. And so it was a very important thing. And as the messenger came from the battlefield, if their king had won, he would cry this word, Euangelion, our king has won. 
It's the victory cry. So when we preach the gospel, we're preaching that our God has won. It's not the possibility. It's the, the reality, the assurance that Jesus won on the cross 2,000 years ago. The things that the Holy Spirit does in and through us are an outflow of the gospel. It's all done for the glory of God and to bring people to his kingdom. But the gospel is that good news. Our king has won. It happened 2,000 years ago. It's not the possibility of salvation. It's the assurance of salvation. We all know the story of Paul and Silas and Philippi. They had been preaching and the city had gotten uh, upset with them. They beat them, put them into the prison in stocks. And there they were. As the night rolled on, they were praying and singing. And an angel came. There was an earthquake. Everyone was freed. And the jailer brought them out. And he asked them, What must I do to be saved? And Paul's response was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved you and your household. It doesn't say you may be saved. It's positive. You will be saved if you believe on Jesus. There are other gospels that, might, that say you might be saved, but this is not the gospel of Jesus. The good news is that when you submit to this king and he becomes your savior you live with the assurance of salvation one more thing the gospel is good news not good advice the bible has good advice it's good for exhortation good for many things but when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the good news that our king has won. It doesn't depend on me or, what, or you or what we do. It depends on what he has already done. So the good news of the gospel is actually a victory cry from the battlefield that announces that our king has won. Therefore, we're free. We're going to look now at a couple of verses that use this word, euangelion. And we're going to turn to Isaiah 52. Obviously, that was in the Old Testament and written in Hebrew. But you'll remember about 200 years before Jesus came on the scene the Jews were dispersed they had learned the Greek language and many didn't understand the Hebrew and so the Old Testament was translated into Greek and we call that the Septuagint and so most of the time when the New Testament writers are referring to the Old Testament they're using the Septuagint so let's look at this uh, verse in Isaiah 52, verse 7. How wonderful, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings euangelion, the good news, who proclaims peace, who brings euangelion, the glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. 
Now we're going to turn to Revelation 14. Verse 6, we're all familiar with the three angels' messages. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the eternal eongulion, the eternal gospel, to preach to those who dwell on their earth. So in order to understand what this verse really means, we need to look back at the beginning of this chapter to find out what this gospel is. Otherwise, we might be having a different gospel. So let's look at Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now we just noticed in Isaiah that how lovely are the feet of the messengers that bring the good news, that say to Zion, your God reigns. This is the only place in Revelation where we find the lamb is standing. What's the significance of that? What does it mean? It means that the lamb is now reigning in Zion. He's standing, he's reigning in the place of deliverance for God's people. And as we read there in Revelation, he's standing on Zion and around him are the 144,000. All of them singing because he has been victorious. When John sees this, God says, don't worry. I'm sending three messengers with the good news. And those are the three angels' messages. When we recognize that it is in the context of the Lamb, Jesus, winning and reigning in Zion, the three angels' messages take on a different meaning. They're coming with, from the battle cry, field with the cry, Our king has won. And so the first angel's message can be summarized. The creator God has won. Worship him. The second angel's message can be summarized. The other power has lost. And the third angel's message, choose the one who wins. That's the three angels' messages. Because they come in the context of the good news that our king is one and is reigning in Zion. So now we can understand the good news a little better. It's not the probability that if you behave well, and do everything right, you'll be saved. It's not good advice, even though good advice is in the Bible, but the gospel is the victory cry from the battlefield that's brought by the messengers that says, your king has already won on your behalf. So we can have assurance that Jesus is on our side and he has won and we can win with him we will win with him therefore it's the good news we don't have to have anxiety about whether we'll be saved about what will happen at the end of the world the judgment a lot of people are concerned about those things but we have the good news. Our king is one. And if we're on his side, we will win with him. So we can have assurance. And so I want to share with you this morning some of the portraits or pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation that help us today to have assurance of his love, assurance that he's with us. 
The first portrait is in Revelation chapter 1. And verse 1 begins with the revelation, or in the Greek, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ. The apocalypsis means the unveiling or the revealing of something. And so you think about a, a great artist has just finished a picture. It's hanging in the gallery, but it's covered up. It hasn't been unveiled yet. And you're there watching as they open that curtain and unveil this beautiful picture. And you say, wow, isn't that great? And that's what this book is all about. The unveiling of the Jesus, our King, who has won for us. The gospel, uh, the full gospels, tell us a lot about Jesus. But Revelation shows us what his triumph was able to do for the whole universe. Revelation is a multi-dimensional book. Sometimes we're in heaven, sometimes we're on the earth. Sometimes we're in the past, sometimes we're in the future. And so, uh, theologians call this multidimensional apocalyptic literature. It shows us how incredible it is what Christ has done for us and the whole universe. So there are some succinct worship scenes. And they're worshiping the Lamb that was won, has won the battle between good and evil. So that this unveiling, this wow, can take place. The incredible good news that we need for times like today. So that we can have total assurance. So, let's look at Revelation 1 verse 5. And, Jesus, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Some of your translations have the word loved there. But in the Greek, it's a present continuous tense. He loves us. He loves us and he continues to love us. But the second verb there is in the past tense. He has released us from sins by his blood. Interesting contrast between those two verbs. The one who loves us and continues to love us and then one who has already 2,000 years ago, released us by his blood. So this, these two verbs introduce Jesus in the book of Revelation. Two realities. His continuous love and his accomplished deliverance on the cross. We're going to now turn to the first portrait that we see, first picture of Jesus. And the, that we're going to look at in the book of Revelation. And it's found in verse 7 of chapter 1. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is going to be. Amen. And then we get the first red letters, those words of Jesus in the book of Revelation. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So, what are Alpha and Omega? Okay. We know that Alpha is the beginning letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So, if Jesus were talking to us today, what would he say? Omega. 
I'm the A and the Z. That covers whoops, everything in our experience. I challenge you to find a problem that you can't ha find between A and Z. They're all there. It includes the C for cancer, the D for divorce, the P for pandemic, the F for financial trouble. Whatever difficulty you have today, Jesus has already covered it. He is with you. He's going to, to see you through. He covers the whole alphabet. So he gives us this assurance of his blessing at all times. That idea is going to be repeated many times in Revelation. But if you've gotten some bad news, know that Jesus is with you, whatever it is that you are going through. So the first picture of Jesus that we look at is he's everything. He's the A to Z. He's always with us. The second portrait is found in Revelation 1 verses 17 through 18. Verse 17 says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Someone has counted 365 times in the Bible where do not fear is mentioned. And here we have it. Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. Different words than Alpha and Omega, but the same concept. I will be with you. Now it's interesting when we look at the first and the last. Last is the Greek word eschatol. We, we get the word eschatology from that word. Many of us have been to seminars about eschatology, last time events. We're interested in that in Seventh-day Adventists. But Jesus is saying, if you talk about eschatology without talking about me, you're going to be afraid. Because I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Even if we die, Jesus is there. He's with us. So every part of our lives, Jesus is a part. We don't have to fear anything. For our second portrait, we're going to look at Revelation 5, uh, actually chapters 4 and 5. In chapter 4, we see a beautiful worship scene where the creator, if, who's created everything, is being worshipped. But Revelation 5 is a different picture. We see a book, and no one is able to open it. No one has found that's worthy. And John begins to weep. He's desperate because no one can open this book. In verse 4 he says, So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to uh, open it, to look at it. But in verse 5, we get the good news. 
One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. You know that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, right? It's Jesus who is the root of David who has prevailed. This is the good news. It's a done deal. And that's how we should spell salvation. D-O-N-E. Done. He has overcome and is able to open the book with its seven seals. And so John hears, uh, wants to see this lion. There's an interesting thing about Revelation. John hears and then he sees. Happens over and over again. And as he hears something and he turns to see, he sees a bigger expanded picture of what he heard. In chapter 7, he hears the number of the redeemed, 144,000. But as he turns and sees, he sees the great multitude of the redeemed. So in chapter 5, he, he hears that the line of the tribe of Judah has overcome. But when he turns to see, this mighty lion has triumphed. What does he see? Verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God set out into all the earth. The lamb is now standing. A lamb standing as if it was slain, but is now very much alive. It's standing and is the one that has overcome. And so we have this wonderful, incredible song of the redeemed in verse 9. And they sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the book and to break the seals, for you were slain and purchased. And, and purchased, notice that past tense, to God, men of every tribe and tongue and people of the, and nation. So here we have this second portrait. Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who has overcome. What assurance that can give to us. For our third picture, I'd like us to look, go to Revelation 19. This is the picture of a bridegroom that wants to come back for his bride. But his bride is shameful. So in Revelation uh, 7.14, we see the saints have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here in chapter 19, we come to the wedding. And because the bridegroom refuses to leave his bride here, even though the bride can't fulfill or has not been faithful, has not that wonderful bride that we would all like to have. God does something beautiful for her. Remember, God told the prophet Hosea to go and marry an adulterous woman. There was a reason for that. God knew that we were adulterous. He wanted to show what God wanted to do for us. So here in Revelation 19, the husband brings the clothing for the bride. Verse 7. Let's be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. 
Notice, the fine linen was given to her. It's nothing she had. That would represent, if, if it were our own, it would represent that we had never sinned. But we know that's not the case, is it? But God clothes her, her in this fine linen, bright and clean. And now God speaks to her as if she was righteous. Verse 9, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These truings, saying, these are the true sayings of God. If you continue re reading, Jesus appears. Everyone is wearing white in the picture that follows. Even the horse is white. The angels are white. The people are white. But Jesus is wearing something different. Verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. That's what it cost for us to be wearing the white robe for this marriage. His blood. His blood is important in every picture that we see of Jesus. Because it's by his blood that he overcame. And so we have the assurance that Jesus will be faithful to his bride. The last portrait that I'd like to share to you today is found in Revelation 21. We know these verses very well, especially in times of loss, we think of them. We want that new world where there will be no more death, no pain or suffering. And so we read chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, this loud voice repeats the covenantal phrase we heard throughout the Bible. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Because God refused to give up on us when we were kidnapped by the evil villain in chapter 3 of Genesis. And we go on, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. But then we need to continue reading to really understand what this is talking about. And he said to me, it is done. Remember, that's how we spell salvation. It's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes. We spend a lot of time on that. In the book of Revelation, this means the one who believes in the Lamb until the end. The one who believes until the end. Those believing in the Lamb until the end shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Those of you that are parents, do you remember that day when you first held your child and the love that you had for him? You wanted to do anything for that child, anything that it needed. That's the kind of picture that Jesus wants us to see of him. He loves us even more than a human parent loves their child. We have been kidnapped. 
But God comes along and he takes away the deceptions of Satan. And he promised us in Genesis 3.15, you'll hurt us on the heel, but I'm going to crush your head. I'm not going to leave you. Jesus says to you and me, I'm not going to leave you here in the power of the Satan, the villain. I have won. And so we have these four pictures of Jesus. He's the A to Z, the assurance of his presence. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the assurance of of redemption. He's that groom who covers his bride, the assurance of his faithfulness and the assurance of his love as a parent loves a child. We can leave today with the victory cry in our hearts, my king has won. I'm no longer, I am not going to be a slave. I am free forever. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very, very, very much that you didn't leave us in this world of sin, that you had a plan. And though it cost everything that heaven could give, the blood of your Son you have redeemed us and you've given us that victory cry. You have won and we can win in you today. So go with us as we leave this place and keep us in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.